Welcome to Under One Roof's Landlord and Letting Agent webinar series, made possible through the generous funding of the Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust. The webinar will start momentarily. For those who are joining us for the first time, Under One Roof is a free, independent service that supports landlords, letting agents, owner-occupiers, factors, local authority housing officers, and others throughout the sector with issues around owning and maintaining a tenement flat in Scotland. Last year, through funding from Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust, Scottish Government, and local authorities throughout Scotland, we attained charity status, which has enabled us to hire full-time staff dedicated to working with landlords and owner-occupiers of tenement flats and those that support them. In the coming months and years, Under One Roof will be increasing the information available on our website, our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts, and through our monthly newsletter. We encourage you to share information we send out with those in your building or in your sector to help us improve the quality of tenement flats in Scotland. Today's webinar will last one hour. We encourage you to post your questions and comments into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. If we run out of time before your question is answered, please drop us an email with your question. The information provided in this webinar is designated to help you understand your rights and responsibilities and to understand what professionals tell you. Any technical information on repairs is designed to help you spot problems with your building and then understand quotations from builders so you can get the best job carried out for the best price. But every building and every group of owners is unique, and so are their problems, which is why the information presented in this webinar can only act as a general guidance. It is not advice or a recommended course of action. When it comes to action, you should always seek professional help with anything more than a simple problem. More details and our legal disclaimer can be found in the About Us section of our website. Finally, if you are a housing professional wishing to record your attendance as CPD, Please visit the webinar page on our website so you can log your participation and receive a confirmation certificate. Thanks for joining us. Let's begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. Uh, this webinar today is on digital tools for property professionals. Um, now, you might be wondering where Mike is today. He's at yet another event on energy efficiency. So you've got me. Uh, they've got me out of semi-retirement to come and do this. And it's just a joy, as always, to be with you. And we've got two really good speakers uh, today for you. Um, the first speaker we're going to hear is Louis Dallancourt from Novaville. And Louis has been spending, I mean, it seems like quite a few years, actually, developing this app, uh, working with Edinburgh City Council. But the app is designed to help owners uh, work together with their co-owners to commission repairs, get good tradesmen in to carry out this work and then get those repairs paid for. And our second speaker is from Safe Deposit Scotland and it's David Morgan. And David runs Safe Deposit's uh, mediation scheme called SDS Resolve. And that works partly online and it can also work uh, in person, face to face as well. So today what we're going to do is we're going to, as usual, run those uh, you know, run videos from those two speakers. Um, that will take us about 25 minutes or so. Um, and then after we've heard from those two speakers, we'll open up for questions. So just find that Q&A and pop your questions in, whatever they might be, and we'll be very happy to answer them. And we're also going to run a couple of polls about just how you feel about using these kind of digital tools. And um, we'd really like to hear what you have to say. It could be a good discussion point. So let's just get cracking on those videos. Jazz is going to get those working. Jazz, as always, is doing this incredibly competent job behind the scene, making everything work. And then I'll see you the other side of the videos in about 25 minutes time, I think. Right. Thanks for joining us, Louis. Um, could you first tell us a little bit about the Novaville Shared Repairs app and how it got started? Sure. Um, so Novaville Shared Repairs is a, is a mobile app which is designed to help people carry out common repairs uh, in their building. Um, it, was, it started um, thanks to a, a Scottish government-backed program called the SIFTEC Accelerator, um, which is essentially a program whereby local authorities in Scotland um, issue challenges to innovative companies 
um, asking for um, for solutions to challenges that they're experiencing in in, the, in their region. And the the one that the city of Edinburgh um, issued was around the condition of property in Edinburgh. Um, and that's um, that's a challenge that Novaville tried to answer and, and uh, was successful in creating a solution for. So in the context of that technology accelerator, um, the, the city of Edinburgh Council and the Scottish government uh, funded part of the development of this solution, uh, which took the form of a, of a mobile app, which is effectively a marketplace where on, um, on one hand, proprietors, private proprietors who live in tenement buildings can organize themselves um, and, and purchase repairs and maintenance to their, uh, to their blocks. And of course, on the other side, um, contractors can also um, advertise their services and respond to these queries um, as they come in from, from the proprietors. And what are the, the main benefits that landlords um, might benefit from by using this app? Sure. I mean, look, it's it's quite a lot because what we've tried to do is to take a process that was previously very disjointed, uh, you know, completely analog, you know, very time consuming, requiring a mix of, you know, phone and email and knocking on people's doors. And we really tried to structure that inside um, one step by step process um, that is available on on, uh, on your mobile phone. So there's sort of there's a few key aspects to it. The, the first one is that, of course, it's a place where you can actually gather everyone who lives in your block. Um, you know, record your, your address, explain um, how many properties are in the tenement, etc., and basically give a bit of a, a create a sort of digital twin uh, for your for your building. Um, the second thing is that um, throughout by following the step by step process, you've really got complete peace of mind that you're following the right process, um, which is you know actually quite important to reducing the temperature a little bit and making people confident that they're not doing something wrong, which could cost them money uh, down the line. So they're sure to, uh, um, yeah, just to be doing things right, and and it's good for their uh, for their peace of mind. In terms of core features, um, the the app actually comes with an integration with the trusted trader scheme, the local scheme, to make sure that um, you're gathering quotes from um, traders that have been vetted by the council, if if possible. Um, you don't have to use trusted traders through our app, but it's um, they're listed. Um, so it sort of makes it easy for people to get access to those um, to those contractors. Um, one of the most important features that a lot of uh, people really like is that the app actually comes with um, a payment account. So we allow uh, proprietors to to open a sort of fully digital account so they can see the, the balance of the account and the transactions um, from the app, which allows them to sort of gather funds and then pay out the contractor. So that adds a lot of sort of transparency to all of the uh, financial aspects of the process, um, and uh, and finally, because you're using the the system, you know it automatically creates this kind of audit trail. Uh, so you can you can show that you know you've dutifully recorded a vote, uh, how many quotes you've received, what what the, what those quotes were. Um, so it really just kind of puts everybody on the same page, increases transparency, provides any evidence you might need later down the line if you want to access. Um, the council's missing share scheme, or even sometimes, unfortunately, uh, go to the small claims court to get some money back. So there's there's a lot of benefits to to using a system that's pur purposefully designed to to help people carry out repairs and maintenance. Uh, can you use the app if you have if you're a landlord and you have more than one property? Yeah, sure. Um, the the way we've designed it, you can um, create. We call it a virtual tenement, which is this digital twin of your building. Um, now, if you're the look, lucky proprietor of more than one flat uh, in various tenements, then you can, of course, create multiple virtual tenements. Um, it's all in the same app. So we have some people actually who've got, you know, sometimes three or four um, addresses registered, which means that they're, you know, the, the person progressing uh, repairs and maintenance in, in various buildings. Um, in, in fact, we're all also starting to work with the, the property factor industry. Um, who are hoping to, to be able to deploy the app um, in, their, in the blocks that they manage. And of course, this requires the ability to manage lots of buildings uh, from one single place. And what about uh, if the building has a factor? How does, that, how does that work with the app? So if the building has a factor, it's best to go and check with the factor first if, um, if this is something that they can, if the, you know, the repair is something they can take on. Um, you know, they're, they're the, the first point of contact. They're first and foremost responsible for maintaining the building. So um, you should check if your building has a factor. And if, if, uh, if it does, then you, sh you should first contact them to check whether they can take charge of the issue. 
Um, sometimes the the factors will decline for any reason to actually carry out the, the repair. Um, in those cases, it's possible for you to use the, the Shared Repairs app. So although we, we designed it first and foremost for, for blocks that self-factor, there might be some occasions where um, you might actually be required to carry out the repair yourself through the app. What if, what if for example, you've got other co-owners that either don't have the app or access to a smartphone, uh, particularly sure. with like sort of other owners that might be a bit older, such like that. Does that still work now? Yeah, it does because we've designed it so that you don't actually need every proprietor in the block to join the system. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually designed to empower anybody who's using it to go to get over the line. Uh, but you don't need to have obviously people who are not confident with smartphones uh, to, to join the system. And in practice, the way that it works inside the app is that um, the, the system allows you to generate some, uh, some letters, uh, basically your standard you know, PDF, um, which, is, which you can download. And those will be pre-filled with all the information that you need to communicate with um, people in your block that don't use digital. Um, so as you're progressing and as you're um, you know, engaging contractors, as you're recording votes, uh, or if you've thankfully gotten over the line and you're starting to, um, to gather payments, you know, the app will make available these letters um, which are pre-filled with the correct information so that you can basically just download them, print them out, and then hand them to people who live in your blog. How do you track maintenance and spending in the app? Like, how does that work? So there's, um, there's this sort of tenement um, payment account mm -hmm. that, uh, that is available through the system. So we work with, um, with a third party um, financial institution um, who allow you to open um, these, this, this sort of in-app tenement account. Um, it's like any UK bank account in the sense that it has um, an account number and a sold code. And you know you can pay into it by paying transfer the same way that you're familiar with. And um, when you're an app user, you can always see um, the balance of that account. You can see the transactions that have come in and out. So it's possible for for anyone who is in that virtual tenement to um, to be able to sort of track spend, to understand uh, who has or hasn't paid in for the the various works that you're engaging in the block. Um, so it makes it, you know, easy to chase people if you're expecting a payment or something like that. Um, so on top of having that for the payment side of things, um, of course, throughout the app, you know, on a need to basis, you create the maintenance job, you create the so-called, you know, the repair, um, and you can just track that uh, all the way through to completion. So you've got this sort of history of all of the work that's been done in the past. Um, you've got a sort of live view into things that are happening now in the process um, that you're trying to finish to to um uh, to purchase a job from a contractor um and this is actually quite helpful if, if you need to sell on your property because you'll be able to show to the, the people you're trying to sell to the work that has been done in the past uh, and you can sort of evidence that you can also show that this this particular building this particular property is on Novaville shared repairs which again sort of increases transparency um we we know how we will, we've heard lots of sort of horror stories about uh, repairs and maintenance in Edinburgh. So um, the fact that the, the history of, um, of the maintenance of the building uh, is there available digitally for a potential buyer to see, um, hopefully will sort of uh, lower the pressure a little bit when, when selling your flat. Now, this is, uh, Noahville's been, it's been operating for a little while now in Edinburgh. So maybe just talk a little bit about how that, how that has gone as far as the take up of it and then what your future plans are. So we um, launched the app very early April um, last year. So it's just been about a year. Um, and we only did uh, our first sort of marketing campaign in November. So roughly six months later. Um, and so in, in a year, we've, gotten about 500 tenements that have signed up. So 500 blocks. Um, on average, you've got about 10 properties per block, right? So it's about 5,000 individual owners now that are um, signed up to the system. Um, so the take up has been really good. You know, that represents about 6% of the addressable market in Edinburgh. Um, and, you know, we've seen repairs ranging from 70 pounds to change the light in the stairway 
all the way through to a big roof repairs costing close to fifty thousand pounds being progressed through um so it's it really works for repairs of any of any type of any cost um we've we're progressing or have completed already about 130 to date. Um, so, you know, it's, it's certainly shown that it's a, it's a robust system that works in getting people over the line. Um, and this has been only in, in Edinburgh. So, you know, in the future, of course, we want to increase um, the, the proportion of buildings in the city that are on the app. Basically, we want every single tenement block that is uh, that doesn't have a factor in Edinburgh to join the system, mm. uh, you know, unless they've got a, a great system that that sort of works for them, and um, then you know, great. But what we're seeing is that the vast majority of blocks actually don't really have that. Um, don't necessarily have any good uh, owners that are particularly engaged. So yeah, we really want to we want for the app to be ubiquitous in 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 Edinburgh tenement blocks. We want to expand beyond Edinburgh. Um, so we're really happy that a couple of councils um, have also asked for the app to be deployed in, in their local um, area. So that's East Ayrshire and uh, Perth and Kinross. So this spring, we'll roll out the app in those localities. Um, and, and beyond that, um, there's a few more things we can do. Um, we're really happy because the, the property factoring industry seems to have really liked what we've built um, and want to work with us so that uh, in the blocks that are factored, um, people can also sort of use the app to see what the factor is doing, to pay their bill, um, to be able to to contact them and, and raise repairs as as they um, come uh, as they become uh, required. So this could be a really good sort of you know customer client engagement tool for the property factors. Um, we'd ideally like to do more work with uh, surveyors so that the app can be not just about purchasing, um, <clears throat> or rather not, so much, not just about progressing repairs, but also provide a, a good tool for surveyors to be able to create data about the building and make that available to people who live in the building so that it's, it's less about um, reactive repairs, but more about proactive repairs and, and creating maintenance plans based on what the surveyors are saying. Um, and finally, and I think that's, that's perhaps the, the biggest uh, one in the long term, is that I think the app has a huge amount of potential for um, the decarbonization of housing. Um, because having a, a, a building that is you know, well, well maintained, uh, you know, wind and water tight, uh, where people engage with each other, um, this is really a prerequisite to uh, some of the, of the retrofitting um, that we're going to need to see in, the, in, in our housing stock in Scotland. So you know, if we're going to lower these buildings' demand for energy, um, and electrify the heating, uh, put in insulation, um, then we're, we're probably going to need to rely on a digital platform um, that can progress you know, complex works, which has in, embedded systems to encourage um, decision-making and, and collective action, um, and, and potentially even you know, a place where people can gather funds, you know, something as simple as that, and, and even apply for, uh, for funding. So, I'm seeing the app as the, the beginning of a, a much longer journey um, to be the sort of, you know, your, your building, except digital. Um, and um, yeah, I hope we'll be here for a long time. <laughs> um, well, what, and then the other thing is that you can, it's still possible to use the app, even if it's not been rolled out in that particular area. You just don't have the ability to do the um, to get the quotes and stuff like that, but it's still possible. Is it still, well, maybe you could check. Is it still possible to use it if you were say living in Glasgow right now, you just wouldn't have all the functionality to. Yeah. I mean, it, it actually, it actually would be, um, the, what you would not have, uh, for instance, Glasgow doesn't have a trusted trader scheme. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't actually have access to that. And currently a lot of the help test, uh, sorry, the, the help text in the app is related to Edinburgh, but technically you could use it if you were in Glasgow. Um, that said, we, we're trying to release um, in new localities in a sort of piecemeal fashion mm. because we really benefit from working with the local authority um, in order to, to deploy the app in those regions um, because it's, it's good to sort of rely on their ability to raise awareness for sure, but also because, you know, they, have, they may or may not have trusted trader schemes. They may or may not have uh, a so-called scheme of assistance for, for private owners. So the, the council can do things to help people. And it's important that the app sort of knows that and can tie up with that um, if need be. Um, so 
absolutely it is possible to use the app wherever you are in Scotland, although technically it's best to wait until Noville officially says that it's deployed in an area before doing so. Um, because you might have to send a, a couple of emails to, to get a, a bit of extra help or to ask a few questions that you wouldn't have to otherwise. Mm. Um, technically, it is it is possible, yeah. Well, uh, definitely looking forward to it being rolled out in, in other areas of, of Scotland. Um, and it's it seems like an excellent opportunity for um, owners, uh, both owner occupiers and landlords, to, to really sort of in, <laughs> improve their opportunities to, to work together. So no, yeah. it's... Uh, um, it's Great news to see this sort of moving forward. So, Lou, thanks so much for your for your time today. No problem. Thanks, Mike. So, David, thanks for joining us today. Um, first of all, could you just tell us about a little bit about Safe Deposit Scotland and what services they offer to landlords? Sure. Um, so, first and foremost, uh, we're a tenancy deposit scheme um, that is approved by the Scottish Government. Uh, when the legislation came into place in 2011, um, I believe we were born um, the year after, in 2012, so we're actually celebrating our 10th year um, anniversary, birthday this year. Um, Safe Deposits was born along with two others um, at the request of the Scottish Government, essentially. Um, so that's what we kind of are. And uh, what we offer um, is a deposit protection um, and mediation conciliation a service called STS Resolve, which we introduced a couple of years ago. That's undergone some rebranding, um, and that service is kind of aimed at facilitating an amicable and kind of satisfactory resolution uh, between two parties. Um, and we offer a uh, training as well. We do online webinars on a whole host of different topics and in-person workshops. Um, the ones we've got coming up right now are Aberdeen, Inverness and Edinburgh. Um, so we're, we're out in the road. We're, we're all over Scotland kind of giving landlords uh, the best training that we can. How would a landlord protect a deposit with Safe Deposit Scotland? Sure. So first of all, you would start with setting up an account, a landlord account with Safe Deposit Scotland. Um, that can happen under a minute. Um, so it's a very quick process. Just ask you a couple of questions. Um, once you're actually in your account, um, you add a deposit. We ask you for your landlord registration number. If you don't have that to hand, you can continue on and go back to it. Um, but we also, um, you can also put in the tenant's details at the same time and along with the email address and phone number. And once that's all set up, there's a button at the bottom that says pay. You just simply pay it and um, you can pay by a debit credit cards, you can pay by check and you can pay by back transfer as well. So it's, it's a pretty, it's pretty easy. Um, and once that's all done, the money gets allocated to the deposit and it's protected within five working days. So it's all pretty straightforward. And then you mentioned uh, that service you introduced a few years back called SDF, uh, SDS Resolve. Mm -hmm. uh, why was that service introduced? Okay, um, it was introduced on the back of the pandemic, actually, um, with rising rent arrears. It was introduced as part of the Scottish Government's toolkit um, to help tenants out, um, to try and sustain tenancies, and also help with, um, you know, getting that agreement to help them with their rent arrears. Um, so that's why it was introduced, um, and that's why we continue on. Um, although the pandemic is not over, people are still having issues um, with rent arrears, along with other, other issues. And how does it how does it work? So you go to stsresolve.com and fill in the application form. Um, we'll get that inquiry through to us and we'll contact you back within five working days just to kind of get a feel for what the issue is, um, especially if it's not just cut and dry like rent arrears. Um, we'll give you a wee call, talk through it, and then we'll reach out to the non-applied party to get their consent uh, to be part of the process, first of all, because it's quite important that they want to go through this process because um, mediation only really works if two parties agree um, to be a part of it. Um, we'll get their side of the story and then we'll just facilitate a resolution. If one can be made, we'll send out an agreement um, in way of a resolution certificate uh, within two working days. Um, and it doesn't always work. Um, so even if it is unsuccessful, we'll still send out a, a certificate just to let you know that you've tried to do it. And can you talk through just maybe, you know, you, you've been working at this for, for a bit now. What are the kind of situations that you commonly see um, where it's it's brought some things to resolution? Okay, so 
the, the I'd say about ninety percent of applications right now are rent arrears, and um, that's what it was introduced for, um, and that's what people seem to have a, more of an issue with. Um, so definite rent arrears is something that is uh, put through, but we can also deal with uh, repairing uh, property standards repairs. Uh, threatened evictions um, and even some antisocial behaviour um, like noise complaints and stuff. We can't deal with all antisocial behaviour. Um, a hard and fast rule I would say is if the police are involved, um, we can't be. Um, so just if, say, the radio is too loud or a tenant has an issue with mm. someone stomping their feet too much and all that stuff. We could, but we, we look at every case and we take it by a case by case basis. And is it just for the use of landlords? Um, it's not actually, it's actually for everyone. Um, it's for landlords, tenants, agents can use it. And most recently, local authorities have been in touch um, to use it as well. Um, so anyone can use it at all. And is there, a, do you have to pay for it? Is there a charge from the service? It's completely free. It's completely free. And we, right. and we will remain it uh, to be free. Um, so it's accessible to everyone to use. Um, so yeah, cost nothing. That's great to hear. And uh, finally, just you know, how would you get in touch with Safe Deposits if they had uh, any more questions they'd, they'd like to ask about the service? Sure. So um, you, if it's just for STS Resolve, um, you can go to stsresolve.com and just fill out the application form. If it's entered with deposits and if, or if you want to know more about the service, you can contact Safe Deposits Scotland um, on 033 Two one three one three six, uh, or you can email us at info at safedepositsscotland.com. And one last question on the, uh, the question that we were talking about today on the webinar is about the digital aspect of it. So um, have you been doing a lot of these um, online and you find that to be helpful? 100%. We actually find that more people show up um, to online training um, especially training, uh, we host webinars uh, fortnightly and they have a massive turnout. Um, part of the STS Resolve uh, program can be online as well, um, especially when it comes to the mediation part of it, um, where they meet with the mediator. That would most likely be using Zoom um, and just so people can see each other um, if they're comfortable with it, of course. But yeah, a, a big online presence. And is that something where you've um, seen, I mean, obviously it was probably something that was brought in probably around the same time as all the COVID restrictions and stuff like that to allow that to, to, to go forward too. But is that something that you would imagine has had added benefit in the sense of making it easier for people to, to use the service because they can do it from the comfort of their home? Exactly. And it's not something we're going to be stopping anytime soon. People are comfortable with it just with the length of time that they have had to use it. Um, so we, we're, not giving that up um, if it makes people more comfortable and it makes them come to the table and talk about their issues we're more than happy to continue on the digital aspect of it great well thanks david very much for your time today you're very welcome Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to our live session and uh, both Louis and David, I, I hope, are going to be able to join us. Louis was having a few problems with his connection earlier on, but hopefully we'll bring both of those back in again to answer any questions that you've got. There, we've got them all. Fantastic. How nice to see you both again. Um, so I've actually got a lot of questions myself about these things. I just find this is quite fascinating because I think you know, one of the huge problems that I think we've all had is just trying to communicate with other owners. Um, and, and it's one of the big things that we keep talking about, isn't it? Just how we get other owners to respond to us sometimes. So I just wonder, Louis and David, if you if you could both just tell us, you know, just what you think the benefits are of doing things online and with 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 with, with digital media rather than face to face. Um, Louis, you look like you're thinking, David, maybe you'd like to kick off and just yeah, say. <laughs> no <laughs> problem. Yeah, sure. I think it comes into ease uh, more than anything else, um, it, especially when it comes to STS Resolve. We have a chat box function um, and it's just it's easier for people just to use that chat box function rather than kind of getting into uh, some people might not be comfortable meeting face to face or picking up the phone. So just having that kind of digital aspect of it, um, it certainly does help the applicant um, and they feel a bit more comfortable, especially when you're dealing with some hard topics, maybe rent arrears, um, a whole host of things, maybe repairs, and they're not comfortable speaking to someone 
over the phone or in person, um, the digital aspect really comes into play there and it, is, it, it really helps. So it just feels like a safer space for people, you think? It really, really does. Um, and even when we get through past conciliation and go and go into mediation, that's done primarily on Zoom. And people are so much more open on Zoom than they would be maybe if they were all in the same room um, in person. Um, so it, just, it creates a, a safe space for people to talk. Right. Louis, have you found out other benefits of doing things in this sort of digital way? Indeed, but by the way, please remove my camera if I'm if my connection is patchy. But what I meant to say is that from my perspective, um, they're both quite complementary, um, and in the best cases, it's not either or. Um, so, for instance, in our app, th there is a chat um, so that people can basically, you know, just send me messages to each other very much like they would on WhatsApp. Um, but it might be a lot easier for people to approach their neighbors in person. And tell them we're trying we're using this app for common repairs you know please join it and here's how you can do that and then for the more difficult conversations perhaps to be taking place there around uh, uh, the same version of the truth which is what those digital tools are good for you know they just make sure that everyone's on the same page and that facilitates discussion so you know having an app is never going to fully replace some of the important interactions we need to have with our neighbors but it can sort of you know, provide this, this as you said, this safe space, actually. But I think it's the right term where that communication is, is made easier. Right. OK, so safe space. Um, and, and all of you out there, you know, it'd be very interesting to hear what you think about these things. So just keep popping things in the chat, please, or in the Q&A and in the polls, of course, which are there. You can see that wee red dot by the thing that says polls. Do, do put your views in if you haven't yet done so. So um, both these apps... Is there a cost to them? Um, David, I think you said yours was free. Um, yes. How's yours funded? How, how does it work? Well, um, basically off the interest of the deposits that we hold, first and foremost, like I said, we do, we're a deposit uh, protection scheme. So we hold about just under 70% of um, the market share in deposits. So the interest of that allows us um, to start up services like SDS Resolve um, because we are not-for-profit um, any surplus profit goes out back into the PRS um, and into services like SDS Resolve. Right. And 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 and, and Louis, how is the Noberville app funded? Because you're you're a commercial organization, aren't you? Yeah, yes we are. So we we're a private business um, and our main business model is to charge a commission on every repair that goes to the system, which currently is at two percent and it tends to, to go down when you go into the, the more expensive repairs. Um, so if you're, um, say, a, a flat of 10, uh, if you've got a repair costing um, £1,000 overall, so it could be a survey, for instance, then it really just comes down to um, a few pounds, two to four pounds per, per property. Um, we, we were, um, we did receive some funding from Scottish Government and the City of Edinburgh Council to get the, the app going. Um, we added a lot more of, of our own private funding as a company, and, and currently the business model is a is a commission basically on the repairs going through. Okay, and is that commission something which the owners will find themselves paying for, or or, or just how's it going to work practically? Yeah, um, so it's something that the owners pay, and it's something that is marked up uh, the trader cost. Okay, so if if the repairs for a thousand pounds, then it's one thousand pounds and twenty with the Nova app, and then this is divided uh, amongst all of the flats and it's added to the tally so it's quite clear in the app that there's a commission being charged and how much that commission comes down to um, for each individual person. Um, we haven't found that people uh, object to the commission. Um, sometimes they might have questions about it initially as before they start using the app which is which is perfectly normal uh, but usually once they start using the app and they kind of see the value that it brings they tend to, to you know, understand why there is a commission mm -hmm. and just to be clear that that is really only paid once a decision has been taken in favor of something so you know there's no charge for downloading the app creating your virtual tenement inviting people gathering quotes there's there's a, a lot of freeness before you get to the point where anything is is charged basically so so that payment only actually uh, gets incurred once you've got everyone to agree to something so when you've, you've got nothing to do You've nothing to lose That's in really trying to get your other owners on board and, and get them all there. 
yeah, it, it definitely I, I, makes sure that our incentives are aligned with the um, with the proprietors, so that we all kind of push in the same direction for sure. Yeah, but that that is really de-risking it for people, isn't it? You know, because I mean, I think so often people are just so worried about what costs they're going to incur and just trying to get things there that they just sometimes just stop, you know, and just don't get started on things. So I, so I think it's great that that is just only there once there's been success. Um, David, when people actually come into a mediation session with you, what happens? I mean, what does it look like? What what what, what can people expect the whole thing to be? Sure. So we, you first you'd go to sdsresolve.com and you would go into the chat box function um, and just fill out a couple of details um, about, about the story of why you're on our website and wanting to apply. Um, it will come through to us um, instantly and we will get back to you within five working days. Um, once we do kind of get a better feel of what the situation is, we will then of course reach out to the other party that hasn't applied and find out their side. Um, and we would just try to come to a resolution, essentially. Um, the, the first part of it is all about conciliation. If we can try and help resolve something at that stage, then fantastic. But in some cases, um, it does have to go to the mediator, um, just so we kind of step up above conciliation. Um, and that's essentially it. Um, hopefully we can come to a resolution. Can't always, um, but we always try. Okay, can you just explain to people what the difference between conciliation and, and mediation is? Sure, so the, the conciliation, our, my um, colleague, Gurdjieff, he'll be the person who's dealing with SDS Resolve um, and dealing with all the sort of um, cases that come in and see if it's something we can first of all help with um, or um, something that can be resolved because in some cases it's with, out with our remit. Um, and so that's the conciliation part. We'll try it at our level first and see if we can come to that. Um, if it has to go to mediation, it will go to a mediator um, out with SDS Resolve, a third party, but very trusted. Um, and they've done plenty of mediations um, out with SDS Resolve and um, TDS resolution. Okay, so you're, you're using external mediators. Have you have you had a chance to witness any of these mediation sessions? And Personally, no, because STS Resolve is essentially a new service. I haven't witnessed, um, but TDS Resolution, um, you know, our parent company in England, they have had many successful uh, mediations, and I'm actually booked in to see one um, the next next time something flags up. It'd be really interesting to to see how that Definitely. works with the on with the online thing. Definitely. Would you, has there ever been a, any need when people are doing things to have any kind of mediation that you've seen or that has come through on the app in some way? Sorry, was that a question for me? Uh, it, it was one for, 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 for Louis, actually. Louis. It's just, it's, Novaville's ever had to kind of point people towards any kind of mediation to try and get, get themselves over the line with things. No, uh, we've had few cases where people have needed mediation specifically. Um, what well, we do have are cases where, for any reason, an owner may not be um, able to pay. And then, depending on the, the case, um, that could be one for the council that has a missing share scheme, or sometimes it's, it's one for the courts, for the small claims court. Mm -hmm. So we don't of, offer mediation as a, as a technology company. However, if you're working with a trusted trader, they do have a dispute resolution mechanism. So when, when, whenever there's a trusted trader that's been um, uh, working with that tenement, this the scheme is the would be the first place to go. Uh, but we we directly as a company haven't offered uh, mediation. We tend to signpost people. Okay, so you're, you're taking people in into the correct routes that that that, that they would use. Um, David, do you, has the SDF resolve scheme ever been used to kind of deal with a with a repair situation? I mean, you mentioned it was mostly being used for rent arrears, but are you aware that it's been used for, you know, where people have disagreed about repairs or could it be yes, used? Yes, it, it can be reuse, uh, used for repairs and it has done uh, once previously in its past life uh, under SDS resolution. Um, but we do expect it to pick up in, in terms of um, repairs. Um, right now, the big focus is, of course, rent arrears. So that's what it was brought in for. But um, we are expecting um a lot of applications uh, for repairs as well, especially when the local authorities start coming on board as well. Um, mm -hmm. We expect to see quite a lot of that. All right. So, so could someone who's not a landlord? I mean, I mean, there may be owners who have problems 
communicating with landlords or establishing some kind of common ground with them, would mm -hmm. they be able to use SBS Resolve? They certainly can. Um, again, it, it comes down to if, some, it, if we can help on it, if two parties don't agree on something, regardless of um, you know the two, who the two parties are, um, we can try and help. If it's not within our remit or it has to go to court, um, it have to go down that road, but we can signpost on where to go. And if it's something we can't deal with, but we'll, like I said, we can take it on any case and we'll judge it by a case by case basis. Mm. Yeah, okay. Uh, and just in talking about repairs, Louis, um, I mean, a lot of what you're doing sounds as if it's mostly about the kind of reactive repairs. So someone notices that, that their, their roof is leaking. I mean, can you just talk through just how people will go about doing things um, using the, the Novaville app when they notice that particular problem. And then maybe also, you know, what they would do if they want to get people to do a kind of inspection or some kind of preventive uh, maintenance. Um, you know, Look, I, I, think, I think fundamentally what the app allows people to do is to take a decision on a piece of work that needs to be done in the building. Mm -hmm. And that could be anything from a one-off reactive repair to booking a survey for instance, so that you get a sense of what's wrong with the building. Um, so the, the way it would work is actually quite simple. You know, once you've registered your address and said how many of how many properties exist in the tenement, it's really just a case of what we do, what we call raising a repair. So creating a, a sort of ticket inside the app to say that there's an issue uh, that could in, in, involve taking some pictures of the actual issue and then submitting it, which uh, makes the, the rest of the people who join the app aware of it. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to take that record, that, that ticket, and basically send it to contractors to say, this is the issue we've got. Can we please get a, a, a callback or a quote from you on, on fixing that? Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's very simple. It's just a case of pressing a few buttons. Um, but again, if you've got a clear idea as to what your issue is, you can send it to contractors. If you don't, a better uh, first step might be to speak with surveyors. And we, we frequently see people using the app in order to hire a surveyor. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's that's you know a good first step because from then on you'll be able to say okay it looks like our tenement's got you know ten issues ranging from critical to um, the not not so important and we'd like to progress the first couple in the Novaville Shed Repairs app right now so let's create a um, an, uh, a specific repair for that um, specific problem so it, it really it really takes seconds basically to raise an issue um, on on the app. Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, at Under One Roof, we are very keen that people do get professional assistance. You know, as, as someone says, if you think good advice is expensive, try poor advice. Um, and, you, you know, when it comes to repairs over about so £5,000, we do advise people to get an architect or get a surveyor to come out, have a look at the problem, assess what's going on, and then find the best way of resolving it that's going to solve money in a kind of medium to long term. You know, it might be more expensive up front, but, you know, we're always thinking longer term of, about these things. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're very keen that people do get to, to surveyors. So, I mean, what surveyors or architects might people find through the app? I mean, are there people who are part of the Trusted Traders Scheme or are you linking up with RICS or Royal Corporation yeah. of Architects, anybody like that? So we, we're actually a RICS tech partner and RICS has a great website where you can find a surveyor. Um, what we've done is a sort of halfway house and, and things are always evolving as we keep building new things into the app. But at the moment, before you even get in the app, um, on our website, you'll see that there's um, a scripted conversation you can have um, with, uh, with a sort of shared repairs advisor. And the advisor will ask you a few questions about where your property is, what type of property it is, what kind of repair you, you, th you think you might be facing. And depending on that, it will either say, Go ahead, download the app now, send your issue to a contractor, or actually we think you should be speaking with a with the surveyor first, and here are some names that you can contact. Um, you know, we've we've spoken with most, if not all, of the surveyors in Edinburgh, so we we know them now and, and we're very happy to point people in their direction. Um, and that's before you even join the app. Now, on the app itself, um, the surveyors are not actually so-called trusted traders. That's for you know contractors, building professionals mm -hmm. themselves. Um, however, it's possible through the app to invite anyone that you know that you would like to quote on an issue you've raised. So it's quite possible to, to raise an issue for a survey, send it to the email address associated with a few surveyors in the region, and then they will, they will be looped into the system like any other trader would. 
So, and that's what people do. So we, we see people purchasing surveys in that way quite frequently. Good, okay. And presumably they can use that for architects. On, and presumably that's also the same mechanism they would use if they were using this outside Edinburgh? Correct. I mean, uh, when, I, so when I say surveyors, I mean an architect or consultant, basically. Now, right. outside of Edinburgh, it is possible to use the app with that same system. Um, we tend to wait until we're working with a local authority before telling people there that the app is available um, mm -hmm. for a number of reasons so that we can make sure that our offering ties up with their scheme of assistance um, and, and that we all do this kind of raising awareness piece together. Mm. So technically, even though the app is available in Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, you're right to say that through this mechanism, you can technically use it wherever you live in Scotland. Um, but, you know, we're trying to officially release with new authorities um, on a one-by-one on a -one, uh, basis quite frequently. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it's that, that kind of, sort of localised rollout. And are all the um, authorities that you're working with at the moment, do they all have trusted trader schemes that, that can be linked into? Is that one of the uh, key? Not, not all do. Um, so currently the ones we've got, which is East Ayrshire, Perth and Kinross and Edinburgh, all have a trusted trader scheme. Mm -hmm. um, we're also looking to release in Glasgow for the few tenement blocks that are self-factoring in the city, and there's no trusted trader scheme there. So in that case, you would what, what that really means in the app is that you're not seeing a list of trusted traders, and you need to tell the app, I would like to invite this person or that person by popping an address. But apart from that, there's no, it doesn't really add an extra difficulty. Um, yeah not to have not to trade a scheme. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if people are in that position where where they have got onto the app and, and they're using it and, and there's not a trusted trader scheme, there are pages on under one roof about how to find good traders. Um, and mostly we're suggesting that people go through the, the nationally recognized organizations like National Federation of Roofing Contractors and other people like that, because at least you know with those organizations they kind of they've gone through the paperwork you know they're not fly by night cowboys i mean that, that none of these things are ever a, a total guarantee of quality on any job but i think they certainly do iron out the ones who are going to be problematical from the very start so i think that's why we always put people towards you know certified or um uh, organizations and and firms that are members of recognized trade organizations and we do have whole pages of those on, on Under One Roof. And also the kind of questions you can ask people before you actually go into deciding which ones you actually want to use. So, you know, I, th I think, you know, you can work very well, I think, between um, Novaville app and with the Under One Roof website to help you find good contractors. Um, just the one one last specific question for you, Louis, just on, on the on the landlord side, is there any limit on, on the number of properties that a, a landlord can link up? I mean, I know out there we, 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 we do have people who are representing landlord organisations with some hundreds of properties. Um, is, is there any limit on the number of times they can join up with the app? No, the, the app is super flexible. So if you're one landlord owning lots of properties, you can get all of these properties on the Novaville app. So you'll have access to as many virtual tenements as blocks in which you have um, one of the flats or own one of the properties. There's no limit. Right, that's great, yeah. And and what do you do in the situation where, or what do you advise owners to do in the situation where they, they there's one owner who's just totally thrown, you know, Scott's word for, I'm not down taking part, whatever. You know, what do you do in that kind of situation? Look, I would say that we um, fundamentally encourage people to make use of, um, the, obviously, the law uh, and make sure that people follow the correct process so that they can say the correct things to these people who are not playing ball. Mm -hmm. Very often it's a case of saying, okay, well, I understand that, okay, this is, this is a difficult situation for you, but this is the process that we're going to follow. This is how we're going to notify you of what we're doing. And if you, if you don't wish to partake, there might be consequences later on, and this is what they could be. So we, we're trying to make proprietors confident that they're following the right process, that they, um, and, and make them basically feel empowered throughout the process. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, if people refuse to engage completely, there's not a lot you can do. What you can do is, is do your best to get a decision that binds them to, mm. um, to the, the cost of the repair and makes them liable to the cost of the repair. And then again, if they decide not to pay, then it's either you know the, the council or or the court um, that can come in to step in to enforce the decision. Um, 
but uh, I think Under One Roof actually has very good uh, resources around having difficult conversations, um, and and I, I recommend anybody to have a look at those. They're always helpful. Right. Okay. We've we've got a couple of um, questions here from Nikki Webster. Um, Nick is ask, asking if you're in touch uh, with Aberdeen or Aberdeenshire councils in terms of getting them to use the app. So I, I did speak with Aberdeen Council a while back now. Um, so it's definitely a place where I should go back and, and knock on the door again um, because I know that Aberdeen is asking you, isn't it? I think. <laughs> yeah. Of course. No, yeah. No, but Aberdeen being very tenement, it's definitely a place where I see the app having a, a lot of value. So. Uh, yeah. That'd be the logical next place to go for sure. Yeah, and and and, and Nikki has another question here, and that's about how surveyors can get in touch to be added to the list if if you know they're in an area which is not yet uh, launched as, with Novaville. So, so on today um, there are no surveyors on the list, so you wouldn't be able to add a surveyor to the list. However, on the website we do mention a few a few surveyors, so it's literally as simple as just getting in touch with me and um and letting me know that you know you wish to submit that name for people who live in a certain area uh, and i can get that worked in for you um but currently the the app lists contractors it doesn't list surveyors and i intend for that to change in the short term so if, if there are some that you'd like to to make sure that you know are included um we can look at that together just kind of watch this space kind of thing you'll be you'll be getting there and um, and presumably nikki if you're a member of one of the the registered organizations of surveyors that's how you'll be getting in touch with people, is it, Louis? Through Ricks and um, it's best to speak to me directly. Um, I'll 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 make sure to integrate you if you need to be in, in the system, of course. Okay. So here's a here's a couple of things for Jazz to do. Jazz, can you make sure that people can access Louis's email address so that Nikki can get in touch with him directly? Um, maybe Jazz, if you're listening in, the other thing you could do, I can't see the results of the poll. Could you maybe post those up in the chat? And 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 while you're doing that, I think I'd just like to ask both David and and and, and Louis. You're you're both online all the time. You're interacting with people through these the, through this sort of online means. Have you got any tips for people who are trying to do this? You know, ways that they can use to make their interactions online better for people. David, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, just. <laughs> I would say just be kind of transparent. I would say um, the, the best things that, about being online and having the digital services is the fact that you can be transparent. Um, and you can just tell your story how it is and there will be someone on the other side listening to you. Um, not so much, it doesn't have to be face to face with the webcam on, um, but that certainly does build trust if the webcam is on. Um, but no, just, just be transparent um, and if there is an online service to use and you're not comfortable speaking face to face in real life um, or on the phone, make use of it. Um, don't bury your head in the sand. The sand. Um, it's, it's it's a really good tool. What what do you mean by transparent? Do you mean kind of honest? People, and... Yeah, people are more open and honest. Um, if there's if that if the person there they have an issue with is not directly in front of them, um, and that's just a human thing. I think. Um, even though we've had to kind of bring in more online things because of the pandemic, they're certainly here to stay. Um, and we find that people are far more open um, and far more honest um, just having just by doing it online. Um, it's faster than an email, you get an answer um, pretty quickly. Um, and like I said, quite a lot of people have phone anxiety or they don't want to see the person face to face um, because they're worried or anxious. Um, having that option there um, is. It's just, it's great. Louis, have you got any advice for people on sort of better online interactions? I mean, we hear so much talk about the internet kind of creating conflict, don't we? And here we are trying to reduce conflict. You know, we're going against the trend here. You know, just what, what advice would you give? No, I, I, that's a really good question. And look, I, I think um, if I can go back to the thing I said earlier, it would be that um, it's, Digital in itself is, is never going to be the sort of be all and end all. So I think it's important to make use of these tools, but know that, okay, if they don't work for you or if they're not sufficient or not good enough, then you can also bypass them and you can also try and knock on someone's door and speak to someone and, and help and get, get the help from someone who is better able to use digital. 
Look, I think with the common repairs, obviously, th these are emotive subjects and there's money involved, so they're quite difficult. Um, we try and make sure that people stay to the point um, and we encourage the people to be sort of to the point and, and nice to each other in the chat uh, where, where they can communicate. Um, and certainly, I think the format helps that, right? So that there's less chance of, um, you know, someone having to write a, something very long and potentially not very relevant if it's on a small chat. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I would say, yeah, I would say be to the point, be nice. And if it doesn't work for you, don't use it. Go speak to someone in real life. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. And 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 I think this advice uh, it applies not just to particular apps that you're using, but whether people are using FaceTime or Zoom or WhatsApp video calls. I mean, it's all this. It, is there any difference between them at all? Do you think? I think usually the difference is in the the way that the application itself works, which encourages a certain way of of discussing. You know, you you might not use WhatsApp in the same way you use Facebook or other social networks. So, um, yeah, I think every platform comes with its kind of embedded best practice if you will or or uh, it's its own sort of culture um mm -hmm. now you know the, the one the digital communication that we do through the app is is through chat right so you can expect that you, you can think of it a little bit as with a whatsapp group and, and speak to people in the same way on there as you would on whatsapp right okay yeah okay right well look jess has has just sent through the results of these polls so let's see what what they make of them so we asked whether people would use the Novaville app if it was in their area. 90% said they would. How do you feel, Louis? Ray. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Uh, and um, look, that, that's fantastic. And I'm also quite keen to understand from the 10% of people who wouldn't, why they thought that it wouldn't be a good uh, option for them because there's probably good learnings there for us. Okay. Uh, if you I'm, said no, yeah. folks, put something in the chat quickly, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, and then we asked whether people found it easier to communicate online. That's what we've just been talking about. 80% said they would find it easier to, to, to communicate online. So again, if you want to kind of expand on your answer, put something in chat. We've got about three minutes left. Type fast. Just <laughs> type with all the errors. We'll, we'll read past them, OK? 40% <laughs> uh, uh, of people said they aren't using digital tools yet. Here you are online, you know, what is it that's stopping you from using those tools? Get something in the chat, please. Um, and 30% say, oh, hang on, we've had that. 30% say they are using the digital tools already. And 30% of people have also used resolution services previously. So we've got some kind of background on things there. And while people are sort of typing something in, in, into chat, Louis and David, what do you make of those results? Are they surprising to you? I think it goes to show what we what we were talking about earlier on about how easy it is to more to communicate online and eighty percent is quite a quite a big uh, number, mm -hmm. um, and I, I I think that number we've got especially between like the the, the sixteen to twenty five year olds um, that number I'm sure would be up further. Um, it's much easier for young people to use online stuff rather than in, in person i think um but no that's quite good and it's good to see people have used resolution services before as well um we're hoping to up that as well yeah yeah what I see from, from my side is that on on the app we actually find that people of all ages use the system which we're quite happy with um so we, we've designed the app so that it's inclusive also to people who do not use apps in general uh, but we're finding that a lot of the people who actually have it on their phone and, and who might speak to every day um are not necessarily of the younger generation so we're glad to see that there's kind of wide adoption across all age groups um, mm -hmm. and my last point would be to say yes that it is it is important that even though a majority of people will use digital systems that the, the companies that make these digital systems available such as us um such as ours also have open lines of communications for people who do not use digital um mm -hmm. I think it's very important to keep things you know, inclusive and keep these things open, even though it might not be your preferred way as a company to deal with things. Um, I, I see, you know, when people call up and say, I'm having trouble with the, with the app for any reason, I just want to speak to a real person. And then you can spend 15, 20 minutes on the phone with them. It, it really changes people's experience. And then it makes them a lot more likely to then say, okay, I'll, I'll learn how the app works now that I've spoken to someone who's real. Um, otherwise, yeah. it was it seemed too daunting for me, and we see that quite often. And I think that's quite a good way to proceed. Yeah, so I was possibly just encouraging people that they can't break the thing, 
isn't yeah. it? You know, I think yeah, exactly. not, nothing's going to be messed up if, if you press the wrong button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's often the fear people have. But I mean, obviously, some of those results are a bit biased because we're online. You know, we've got people already happy doing things online. So there's a degree of bias in there. Um, we're just coming to the end of the webinar just now, but just another quick question that we've got in is from Beata Lozignac. Sorry if I've mangled that name, Beata. But she's asking, any talks with Fife Council, Louis? Uh, not directly, no. And again, I would uh, I would very much welcome um, a conversation with them and eventually for the app to be deployed in that region. Yeah, and I, I suppose if you're out there and you'd like the app to be in your area, go and speak to your local housing people and say, You've heard about the app. Why aren't they using it? Um, not yeah, that they've done anything here. Of course, we're totally impartial. But you know, it's like anything. If you want something done in your area, just go and speak to people about it and express your needs. Is what I would say. Great. So look, I would just like to thank first of all everybody out there for sort of listening in, being interested in what we've got to say, taking part in the polls and, and posting their points and questions, and a special thanks to David and Louis for taking part today and contributing their time and their expertise and their thoughts about these things and just for being put on the spot by me. So <laughs> thank you both, David and Louis. And You're I know welcome. Under One Roof will look forward to many more interactions with you both and okay. everybody out there. So thanks very much, everybody. Goodbye. And um, we'll see you at another session, probably in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.